Welcome everyone. Um, this is a presentation about Rochester Institute of Technology. My name is Mark Munzer. I'm one of the senior associate directors of undergraduate admission and also double alumnus of RIT. Um, we have a couple of special guests from the RIT community that we'll be hearing from um, in a little bit. But I wanted to start out by talking about the university and giving you some background about our campus community. Uh, we have over 16,000 total students on the main Rochester campus. Rochester, if you're not familiar, is about an hour and a half east of Niagara Falls, Ontario, and about three hours from Toronto. Um, RIT is one of the largest private universities in the US, and we are primarily an undergraduate university. Um, despite our size, we do have a 13 to one student to faculty ratio, and the average class size is only 22. Um, and all of our classes are professor taught. We have a wide range of international students represented on our campus, including uh, at least 70 Canadians, typically um, a little bit more than that, um, several provinces represented, and we are a very diverse university and a special aspect of diversity at RIT is our deaf and hard of hearing student population. We have over a thousand students thanks to the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, um, primarily Americans, but also Canadians and other international students as well. In addition to the Rochester campus, we also have campuses around the world. Uh, we have two campuses in China, two campuses in Croatia, a campus in Kosovo, and a, comp a campus in the UAE and Dubai. So in addition to many other partner agreements that we have with other universities to study abroad, you can actually study abroad on an RIT campus as well. Um, we do support service opportunities abroad as well as work abroad if you wanna do a co-op or internship um, overseas. So a little bit about our academic programs. The university is made up of nine colleges, all on the same campus. Uh, we have a, close to 100 undergraduate degree programs and about 100 different minors. We also have several combinations of bachelor's and master's programs, including BSMS programs in computing and engineering that are accelerated in nature. We also have a four plus one MBA program um, at the university. We have all different types of pre-professional programs, including pre-med and pre-law. Uh, we have a three plus three uh, law program with Syracuse University. So you do three years at RIT and then three years at Syracuse in their law school. Um, that requires that you're majoring in a social science or humanities area at RIT. We also have a direct med school entry program with SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. So you would apply to RIT for whatever program of study you wish. And if you're admitted into the program, um, it's um, to, you are exempt from the MCATs and guaranteed a spot in medical school at SUNY Upstate. And the deadline for that for grade 12 students is November 15th um, and Canadian students are eligible. So in terms of the programs that are most popular at RIT, um, they really fall in about five different areas, including business, art, design, film and photography, engineering and engineering technology, computing and information sciences, and the um, health sciences and traditional sciences. But we also have many programs in the social sciences, humanities, communication-based programs, and you can start out at the university in an undecided program if you wish. One of the big uh, hallmarks of an RIT education is our co-op program, which is, re is required by about 90% of our majors. RIT is one of the four largest co-op universities in the U.S., along with Drexel, Northeastern, and the University of Cincinnati. Um, co-op, if you're not familiar, is like an internship, but it's always paid and always professional level work. And we have opportunities uh, and connections with over 3,000 employer partners worldwide. So we're always looking to grow um, our employer partners. Um, so you certainly could co-op in Canada if you chose to. Uh, but you are eligible in addition to your co-ops in the U.S. You can then um, work in the U.S. for at least a year after you graduate and depending on your major, like if you're majoring in a STEM area, up to three years after you graduate. We don't charge any tuition while you're on co-op, so the earnings that you make are go directly to you and you can choose whether or not to apply those to your later um, semesters um, or to something else. Um, one of the biggest benefits of a co-op experience is that you have validation of what you want to study and what career or what direction you want to go after you graduate but you certainly establish a network while you're still a student you go through a professional job search you have much more confidence with interviewing with meeting with employers whether it's at a career fair setting or in another setting you have a polished resume and you certainly have a competitive advantage over other students 
that may not have any direct experience uh, before they graduate. In terms of our campus, it's a very modern campus. It's self-contained and it's in a suburban location. So it's about five miles from downtown Rochester. It's in a very suburban setting. So we're very close to all sorts of restaurant options um, and entertainment options nearby, but we are considered brick city as we call it. Um, so there are tons of services available right on campus. We do require all first year students live on campus. Upperclassmen tend to stay on campus as well, but there's a lot of housing um, right across the street from campus that's very uh, student friendly. Uh, and there is shuttle service provided at no cost, uh, both around the campus and to the local suburban area. Um, we have over 20 dining options on campus and we have our own food service operation. So we have complete control of the menu that we offer. Uh, we have a lot of visiting chefs that come from the area featuring all different types of ethnic cuisine. Uh, and even though I've been associated with the university for over 25 years, I still always look forward to going to any of the locations uh, because the food is so good. Um, there's lots of different uh, allergen friendly options as well. Uh, you can see a rendering there of our athletic, one of our athletic facilities on the right. Um, so that's the main fitness center for the general student population. Um, so it's very large and spacious. It goes way further back than what you can see in this photo. Um, behind this fitness center is a beautiful aquatic center where there's a lap pool, a separate diving well, and a recreational pool and a jacuzzi for 25 people. So that's also very nice. We have several basketball courts, racquetball courts, two indoor tracks. Uh, so there's a lot of great facilities. And I'll, I'll let um, Celeste and Jordan talk about the hockey specific uh, facilities later on. We have our own post office on campus. The residence halls are connected by a really cool tunnel system that has laundry rooms and convenience stores and are connected to two of the main dining halls as well as a couple of coffee shops. Um, so it's a very convenient campus to take care of all of your needs. Um, we have over 300 clubs and organizations, so there's a ton of different ways to get involved on campus. And on a typical non-pandemic year, over a thousand annual events. Although I have to say that the clubs and organizations are being very creative and RIT is being very creative and offering events in a safe and responsible way, even now during the pandemic. Uh, we do have fraternities and sororities on campus and about five to 10% of our students participate in those. And some of them have houses right on campus. A little bit more detail about our varsity sports. Uh, we're going to hear about the women's hockey team tonight, uh, which is a Division I team. Um, they compete in the CHA. Uh, and then the men's hockey team uh, competes in Atlantic Hockey, so they're also Division I. We also have club teams for both of those sports. The rest of the athletics at RIT are all Division Three teams. They compete in the Liberty League. Um, the Liberty League is, consists of um, all the primary members are all in side of New York State. So your travel distance for any of these team for any of these um, contests would be um, maximum five hours in terms of a distance. Um, in addition to the intercollegiate teams, we also have a whole series of club sport teams and intramural teams as well. So there's a ton of different levels in which you can get involved in athletic activity. Switching gears just a little bit, we'll talk about admissions. Uh, we have a differential admission policy, meaning that we do ask that you apply directly to a major or an exploration choice, and we will consider you for that uh, program. So you'll start out in that program from day one if you are admitted. Um, one of the reasons we do that is because our programs are so diverse, like what we're looking for from a STEM candidate, for example, um, is very different than what we'd be looking uh, at with a fine art candidate. Uh, another reason is that we want to make sure that we keep our class sizes small for any given major and that you have access to all the facilities and the professors and the equipment, as well as being able to find um, co-op opportunities and full-time opportunities for your major. So most students apply directly to a major, uh, but we do have these great exploration options. If you're not sure about a specific program, you can start out in that for a semester or two be taking classes directly in that core curriculum and then make a more informed decision about a major. Or we have the university exploration option, which is for students that have multiple interests across the university. That's also designed to be a one or two semester program. And all of these are designed so you don't lose time to graduation. So when we look at your application, it is a holistic admission review. So we take into consideration all the pieces that you submit to us 
the, your high school record does have the most weight in the admission decision. Um, so we're, we wanna make sure that you've taken appropriate courses that will allow you to be successful in the major that you select. Um, engineering has some of the strictest requirements and that you need at least one year of chemistry, one year of physics, and up through at least pre-calculus or the equivalent at your school uh, for admission consideration. Um, if you've taken any, um, what would be the equivalent of an AP course or IB or college level work, um, that will only strengthen your candidacy, but it's not necessarily required for admission consideration. Uh, we are SAT and ACT optional uh, starting with fall 2021, so we're very excited about that. The one exception would be if you are applying to that 4 plus 4 with SUNY Upstate for the medical university program, that is, does have an SAT or ACT requirement. Um, that's a SUNY Upstate requirement, and the deadline to apply for that is November 15th, as I said before, of your grade 12 year. Uh, any types of recommendations that you provide from a coach, from an employer, from a teacher, from a counselor, all of that will be considered. We certainly want to know about your activities and interests, um, any awards you've received, community service that you've done, um, all of that will factor in as well. If you're applying with a common application, uh, the essay that's part of the common application will be sufficient. There's no supplemental essays, um, or you can use the RIT application and we provide you a few suggestions for essay topics. If you are applying to the School of Art, the School of Design, or the School, School of Film and Animation, a portfolio is required. Um, RIT is participating in the National Portfolio Day events, which are virtual this fall. Uh, so you can get a critique or official review through the National Portfolio Day. Uh, or you can sign up for one of RIT's own portfolio events that are online coming up um, actually act this week, October 23rd and November 6th. Or you can submit your portfolio through Slide Room and have it not have that interactive component to your portfolio review. In terms of financial aid and scholarship opportunities, uh, we do automatically consider you for a merit-based scholarship. And if you have a performing arts talent and you want to be considered for an additional scholarship tied to performing arts, uh, we ask for a two-minute digital audition submission. Uh, and that's due if you're applying through our regular decision program by January 15th. Um, those scholarships are automatically renewed for all four years. If you have additional financial need, uh, we would recommend you submit the Canadian Student Financial Aid application, which is an RIT specific application, and we'll send it to you after you've been admitted. Um, that will allow you to be considered for additional funding in the form of RIT grant funding, which is also money you don't need to pay back. And you'll also be considered for student employment um, a priority on our campus, and you can work up to 20 hours per week. On the right, you'll see our admission application deadlines. Uh, regular decision is the most common. Uh, January 15th is the deadline, and you would find out about your admission decision by mid-March. But if RIT happens to be your top choice university, we do have early decision one and early decision two. Those deadlines you can see there are November 1st and January 1st. Like I said, early decision is intended for a student that knows RIT is their top choice. We will provide your admission decision sooner, as well as your scholarship and financial aid decision sooner. It is binding, uh, pending that you find that financial aid and scholarship award affordable. So if everything looks okay financially, we would expect you to commit to RIT. The early decision one commitment date is January 15th, and the early decision two commitment date is February 15th. So you finish the process a lot sooner. And all these deadlines are of your grade 12 year. So we have a lot of great opportunities coming up to connect further with us and more in depth, um, including uh, virtual interviews. So you can sign up to meet with me, for example, or one of my admission colleagues. We can talk about your candidacy. We can talk about your specific RIT questions. We can also help you determine what makes sense in terms of what major you can apply to based on your areas of interest, because RIT has a ton of different options with academic programs. We want to make sure you apply to the appropriate one. There's also a lot of video content on our uh, Visit Virtually uh, website. There's my email address if you want to reach out to me at any point with any questions. And I really want to emphasize how great our follow-up and house series are. Uh, we have one going on this week, Monday through Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern time and Saturday at noon Eastern time. And you can do a deep dive into any academic programs of uh, interests that you have so you can actually participate on one or more of those days and we'll be repeating the series again Monday through Saturday November 9th through the 14th similar format 7 p.m. Eastern time during the week and then noon 
on Saturday. There's a special program that November week as well on the 13th in the evening we will be offering a day of photo. So if any of you happen to be interested in photography, uh, there will be a specialized program uh, that week and you can sign up on our website for any of those. So with that, I want to introduce my colleague Celeste Brown, who is the RIT women's hockey coach and uh, one of my new, I would say, friends uh, through the last year. We've gotten to know each other. Jordan Marchese, who is um, a senior this year and will be graduating. She's a student in our Saunders College of Business. And I'm going to stop sharing. We'll go to a gallery format and I'm going to let them both introduce themselves fully to get started. So Celeste, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, super excited to be here. So I'm Coach Celeste. Brown is my last name, but you can go Coach Celeste. Um, this is my first year coaching here at RIT, but the cool thing is I'm also an alumna of RIT. I graduated in 2015 in sociology and anthropology. Um, hockey player here also, and I'm originally from Great Falls, Montana. Hi, Mark. You definitely are my new friend for sure. Uh, my name is Jordan Marchese. I'm a fourth year business management student with a minor in advertising and public relations. I'm also a senior on the women's ice hockey team and I'm from Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. All right, so I'm going to be the moderator going forward and I'm going to ask um, each of you some questions. And I think it'll be really interesting to hear um, what you have to say and give some insight to the audience. Um, Celeste, I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the composition of the women's team currently in terms of nationality? Uh, and then maybe talk about the athletic um, facilities that are available to the men's and women's team. And who do you compete against and how far do the team does the team travel? Sure. So composition of our team currently. So we have about half of our team are Canadians. And so we have a couple from New Brunswick, one from Quebec, one from Alberta, and mostly from Ontario, that greater Toronto area. Um, there's been years in the past where there's only been four Americans on the team, um, which is pretty cool. We love our Canadian uh, student athletes. Uh, since it's so close, it's an easy transition for them to come down. Um, but usually it sits at least half Canadian. Um, in terms of facilities for our student athletes, we were very, very fortunate. We play in an arena that was built five years ago, six, going on our sixth season, the Gene Policini Center. And um, it is just for women's and men's ice hockey. And so Mark spoke earlier about some of our other uh, varsity sports and how they're division three. So just the division one teams are within this facility. Um, this facility is used just for our teams in terms of practice or ice schedule. So we're not sharing with local, local teams or our club programs or anything along those lines. Um, that way our athletes can use our ice at any point to better their skills, better their game. We also are extremely fortunate in that in this facility we have um, our own weight room and our weight room is large enough for all of our student uh, athletes to go in, take care of their business and take care of their body. Um, we, we really focus on the whole experience and the whole development of our student athletes here. So not just the on ice component, component, but the off ice component. And so that strength and conditioning piece is really, really important. And then when you add in another part that is the athletic training, um, we have an athletic trainer that works with our team full time and athletic training in this instance means um, taking care of any injuries, bumps or bruises, um, you know, preparing prehab, making sure that your body is available to play games, et cetera, et cetera. And we have an athletic training room that sits right in our ring um, that has anything from tables to get taped on or stretched. Um, other therapy options, and then cold and hot tubs. And partnered with our athletic trainer, we also has, have a team physician who works with our team and is at all our games. Um, if there was any larger issues or if you, you needed to see that doctor for any other reason, you can access that doctor. Um, other small resources that are within this rink are, you know, we, we have three full-time coaches in a hockey operations. Um, we also have 
uh, video that breaks down all our games, all our shifts, um, heart rate monitors, and we're using a lot of technology again to um, create a well-rounded athletic experience within this building. And Celeste, just as a follow-up to that, um, where is the the Palestini Center in proximity to the rest of campus? And could you talk a little bit about the Ritter Arena too and what purpose that serves? Sure. So um, Palestini Center is, I'd say, in the heart of campus. It's an ideal location. Jordan's shaking her head yes because she knows she's walking to classes in different buildings. Um, but you know, it's very accessible to some of our major colleges in that it's a five minute walk. Um, you know, if you want to go study at the library, it's a one minute walk and, you know, go get food close to our student, um, student center and, um, soon to be new building right up the hill. Um, sorry, Mark, what was, oh, the Ritter and the Ritter. So the Ritter is our, our other arena on campus, which we are insanely, um, fortunate to have two arenas and our hockey programs used to play out of the Ritter arena and it's a beautiful little arena that sits um, kind of on the opposite side of our campus also similar close to the heart of campus um, but that that houses you know local programs club teams intramurals um, figure skating learn to skate classes learn to play hockey classes um, and it also is kind of the home. They've converted some of those locker rooms into other teams. And yeah, great. And can you talk about the membership of the CHA? And then maybe yeah. as a follow-up, Jordan, can you talk about what it means in terms of those travel distances and what it means for your family and some of the other Ontario families to be able to come see you? So we play in the CHA, that's what Mark's referring to as College Hockey America. Uh, consists of Syracuse, Robert Morris, Penn State, Mercyhurst, and a team in St. Louis, Missouri, which is probably one of our furthest trips. But most of those trips are within a four hour radius max. And Jordan can talk more about that. Um, but again, a strong, strong league, um, playing some of the top players in the nation. And, um, you know, that St. Louis trip would actually be a, a flight, which most of our trips are bus trips. Um, other than that, just to add, Mark, the, the furthest dis distance that we would travel would be to, say, a Minnesota, um, which would also be a flight, and then everywhere else is accessible in the Northeast. Yeah, and jumping off of that, as we mentioned before, I'm just right, so, right outside of Toronto, um, and Ontario especially, being so close to Rochester, it's super easy for home game travel, and then when we talk about the away teams in the CHA. My parents are still making the drive in a COVID-19 free world. They would be crossing the border every other weekend to come watch me play, which means the world to me um, that I get to see them even in that away rink for like 10 minutes after the game as I'm heading home means the world to me. So being close to home, it's great. And just speaking on behalf of the men's team, um, the Western pod of teams is kind of a similar geographic region with the exception of Air Force out in Colorado. That'd be their furthest conference opponent. And then the East pod of the Atlantic Hockey Association is um, primarily in New England and Eastern New York. So um, they, they have a reasonable travel distance for a lot of their contests as well. So switching gears a little bit, um, Jordan, if you could take yourself back four or five years as you started the university search and going through the recruiting process, could you just describe what that was like? Um, what factors were important to you as you went through that? What were your highs and low moments, difficult challenges in making a decision? And why did you ultimately pick RIT? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, thinking about it, you'd think it's a very stressful time. Um, but thankfully, you know, RIT made it very easy for me um, in the whole admissions process and kind of selecting that school. As we talked about, the facilities at RIT are absolutely amazing. Um, and I went through my fair share of tours at other schools and RIT definitely stood out the most. Um, the proximity to home, which means the world to me, as I said many times before, but family is everything and having them so close to me means, means a lot. Um, and yeah, the highs and lows. So 
being that uh, I was lucky enough to not feel as much stress as applying to RIT and everything. The dashboard for admissions was really easy and using all my resources that were available. So contacting the financial aid office if I had any questions in terms of filling out that form that I've never seen before uh, being in grade 12. It was, it was uh, very easy um, using RIT's resources and contacting the people that were to answer those questions that I may have or even the questions my parents had. Um, as I was the first of my family to go to school. Um, but yeah, if that answered in all the questions. Great. And along similar lines, Celeste, um, do you have anything you want to share from your personal um, experience of being, you know, going through the, you know, recruitment process and the selection process? Or do you have any advice um, based on your work with student athletes in general as they go forward with the college search and selection? Yeah, I mean, Mark, you're really making me think to go back to my recruiting process. Um, I think um, the biggest thing that I can say even then and now is to be a conscious consumer and what you're you're exploring. So I always tell recruits or future recruits to make sure you, you are doing your due diligence. Um, you know, the internet is an unbelievable resource. Uh, you can even get on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, you name it, and you can find out information. And it's really, really important that it's a good fit for you. And you're not just picking a university for other reasons in that um, Jordan found her niche here in business. And that's really, really important. Whereas if she just wanted to play hockey and didn't pick a school that had business also, then she probably wouldn't be as happy as a student athlete as she is now. And um, I think it's also important to note that, yes, you can go online and use dashboards, et cetera, et cetera, but your coaches or the coaches that are recruiting you or helping you in this process are there as resources. And no question is a bad question. You can't ask a question too many times or reassure or re-ask the question in a different form so that you're fully understanding. And most of the coaches understand on a deeper level what their athletes, uh, what their student athletes day to day is like, uh, what their process was in terms of maybe they came in decided, wanted to switch major majors. So ask them all the questions. If they don't have the answer, I guarantee they'll go seek it and find it. Excellent advice. So switching gears a little bit, Jordan, can you talk what it's like to be a division one student athlete and what a typical day is like for you? Yes, for sure. So. I uh, take a lot of pride in, in being a Division One athlete. It was my goal since I was a you know young girl playing hockey um, and definitely thinking of myself as a role model for people like my younger sister who also plays hockey. Um, but yeah, a typical day would be waking up fairly early around 7, 7.30 for an 8 a.m. class. Uh, right now it would be on Zoom, so I just hop on this computer at this desk in my room, but um, in a regular world, I'd be walking, you know, two minutes from the parking lot where the Gene Policini Center is to the business uh, building and getting into a classroom there. And then the class is usually an hour long, depending, and then I'd go get some breakfast and then walk my way over to the rink and get ready for workout and practice around 11 o'clock. And that's where I get time to see my teammates, you know, talk about our morning and Kind of get ready to dial in for practice and stuff like that and then for about two hours we'd have our practice and workout after do a rollout or just kind of cool down and then head to an afternoon class or just study somewhere um, on campus or at home and then also eat lunch and then at night kind of just cool down if i have a night class that's usually three hours but if not it's just dinner and just chilling with my roommates uh, maybe some Netflix after before bed, but that's about it. And Celeste, do you have anything to add in terms of what you observe from, of RIT student athletes or what you recall from your experience? No, I, I think Jordan hit it on the nail. Um, you know, as a student athlete, student comes first. That's the only thing I would say. And, and Jordan painted the picture well in that she gets up, goes to class. Usually she does have morning classes. Sometimes she has night classes because student athletes have to manage their schedule to have that block off to practice. Um, but again, student comes first before athlete all over the country, not just at RIT. 
Um, but, you know, Jordan sort of talked about how she would study and manage her time. And that's an important piece in this puzzle is that uh, the student athletes have to be diligent and prepare ahead of time in their process and their daily schedule. That actually leads into my next question. Jordan, can you, have you seen an evolution in yourself uh, going from freshman year until now in terms of how you've been successful balancing being a student and being an athlete? Yeah, for sure. I feel like especially coming from high school where you're there for six hours in the day from morning till afternoon, and then you have whatever night hockey that you're doing on the side, but here it's it's in the middle of the day or whatever time it is. So you definitely have to manage your time. And freshman year, everything was new and you might've had some hiccups along the way, but now going, in, going into my senior year, I, I feel like I have it down packed that school does come first in, in every way. And having a coach like Coach Celeste who completely 150% supports that um, is huge. And that in no way do I feel like uncomfortable if I have to miss a, a, a practice for class. I know that class comes first all the time. Um, but yeah, definitely taking care of your academics before. And I feel like without having one or the other, I feel like my time in the day, I'd feel like something's missing because I don't have hockey or I don't have class. So having a busy schedule is, I think, good. And, and it allows me to really take care of things and, and feel a sense of like, pride and that, um, you know, I, I do have this busy schedule and I'm handling it and I'm taking care of it. That's great. Um, Coach Les, could you talk about RIT's support services um, and how students, you know, are students comfortable seeking support? Um, what's kind of the culture around that at RIT? Yeah, I think RIT is an unbelievable place for student athlete support or student support in general. Um, for being a mid-sized university, I would say, um, the, I think the best resource you have is access to your professors um, and access to your advisors. Um, there's, of course, tutoring that's available, writing center. Um, you can go seek research help in the library, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but professors put their students first here. And I think that's pretty unbelievable in that they know your name. Uh, you can email and ask for office hours if they're if you can't attend the already given the office hours. Um, and because you can go and relate to them and they can understand where you're coming from and you can um, relay your confusion or question right to the source, it it's next level support, in my opinion. Um, the other cool thing about that is, you know, of course, there's always the question about support. But I always like to talk about the question or the, the point of being able to push your academic boundaries because of those relationships in terms of um, going and being able to just brainstorm an idea or think outside of a box or outside of the normal typical academic box because you feel comfortable in those conversations. And then also uh, to add there is, is that relationship with your peers. So Jordan, yes, she has teammates that she can talk to, but the class sizes are are on average 22, 23, and she knows her, the person sitting to the left of her and the person sitting to the right of her. And now in her Zoom, she knows who they are and that she can just shoot them a text or say, hey, do you want to study? And that resource alone, again, allows you just another opportunity to grow and um, ask questions if need be. Jordan, do you have anything to add about that? Kind of like a, your academic experience, um, relationships with professors, and do you feel prepared for this next step that you're about to take after graduation? It's sad to say, but yes, I am prepared for um, after school and what, what RIT has prepared me for. But yeah, you know, Coach talked about it. I know the people to my left and I know the people to my right on Zoom or in-person classes. And actually, an RIT uh, student in the College of Liberal Arts um, created this app called Slack where we could message people. And I think in every single class of mine, we utilize it. And I am constantly messaging my group members or my classmates or even my professors if I have a quick question. And they're always there to answer. Um, I've never felt like a number or just like a code. I've always felt like, you know, a, a student that they care about. And I feel like that's, um, not really common in a lot of university or colleges. 
uh, because the numbers are so big, but having a classroom size smaller than even some of the classes in my high school is huge because the teachers know me, they know my, my learning style and they understand, you know, that I am an athlete um, and do kind of like accept that and, and are very flexible with things like that, so. Jordan, um, switching gears a little bit, can you talk, I know we're, you've got a really busy schedule between your academics and your athletics, but what are some of the fun things that you've done as a student? What are some of the memories that you're gonna take with you of RIT and Rochester, kind of outside of both of those aspects? Yeah. So RIT offers a bunch of events and, and even in a, in a COVID world, there's, there's a bunch of safe activities to do. Actually, last week I was smashing pumpkins um, outside of uh i think it was outside of clark or something like that but it was it was a lot of fun and it was definitely safe we had our masks on but um yeah the memories of of rochester and kind of freshman year you don't really explore outside as much and then sophomore and junior and senior year of course i found a lot of good hiking trails a lot of good spots to eat i'm a big foodie i love food so rochester has a, a couple good spots um and yeah just Rochester is very unique and has it's like kind of it's kind of quirky, um, but I definitely love it. I absolutely love it. And uh, the RIT campus, there's always something going on. You can hear like music walking down the quarter mile and you're like, oh, what's going on over there? And you walk over there and everybody's super friendly. So a lot of things, a lot of memories. So true. Uh, so a couple more questions uh, before we wrap things up here. Uh, Celeste, what's your professional advice for student athletes, specifically from Canada, when it comes to promoting themselves to scouts and coaches? Um, and do you have any advice about when students should kind of initiate the process of reaching out to coaches and what they should include in a resume? Yeah. Um, so our, our rules of our governing body don't allow us to speak to you until uh, June 15th between your grade 10 and grade 11 year. Um, but that does not mean that you can't um, promote yourself before that. Um, and it can be as simple um, as just sending an email. Pretty much every coach on our staff has their email up online. You're able to go grab that and you should, you should just update us. And what you can do is your name, your graduation year, which is really, really important. So we understand what year you are looking to come to RIT. Um, what team you play for, your number, and um, why you're interested in RIT. I always, always love that in an email because it's important that, that you fit the university. I talked about the fit on both sides, university along with our athletic program. Um, and so for those, those student athletes or prospective student athletes before that June 15th date, um, you can continually update us. We, we can't uh, reply or engage in conversation, but it is nice to kind of check mark where you're going to be. So if you tell us you're going to be at this tournament or playing this game at this time, very, very helpful. And then um, on top of the emails, the other cool thing is that we have a recruiting questionnaire that's always accessible up on our um, website or athletics website on our women's ice hockey page that you can go fill out when you get your information and it just it creates a seamless uh, line of communication but again I, I don't think there's um, a too early time um, as long as you understand that we're not allowed to reply and that's why we're not replying you're not getting mad at me why I'm not replying to you um, but there's also, um, again, that con conscious consumerism that comes in there and that um, while you're doing those emails, you should be researching the university. And if you're researching RIT and understand and really, really feel like it's a good fit for you, then you can be persistent. Um, but if it doesn't have your, your major that you want, then you should know that. And um, again, it, it comes down to being the ball in both courts ours as a recruiters and yours as a, a student. Thank you so much. So in closing, I just wanted to ask both of you if you have any parting words of advice that they that you can give to a potential future student athlete. Do you want to start, Jordan? Yeah, I could start. Um, don't stress. It's supposed to be a, an enjoyable experience and and just remember that communication is key and communication with yourself, checking yourself um, with your parents, 
with your future coach, admissions, using all your resources that are available. Um, and there are plenty, especially at RIT. Um, it's, you know, if you have any questions at all, there are answers to them and then you can get them just by reaching out and communicating that. Um, and to like fully immerse yourself in the culture and what uh, your school has to offer because you don't want to be going into your senior year and not have, uh, you know, just have done hockey only in school. You want to really like open yourself up to whatever um, your school has to offer and RIT has offered amazing things um, to me outside of just academics and with hockey. And then I'll just add, Mark, again, be a conscious consumer. That is the best thing I can tell you. Um, other than that, there's a place for everyone. Um, and uh, in this sport, if you want to make, if you want to go to college and play hockey, there's a place for everyone at some university. Um, I'll be a little biased in that RIT is incredible and provides those opportunities that Jordan talked about. Um, from a holistic experience instead of just two areas. And that's really, really important. And Jordan's hit the, hit the nail on the head. She's out there making memories, whether she's walking up and down and hearing music or smashing pumpkins. Um, it's important to understand that stuff. And that's where that consciousness of doing your research comes into to play. And sorry, one more thing I'm rambling, but to, um, to really think about what you're looking for in your university and in your athletic experience um, and the role that you want to play and the role that you want in both. And uh, that reflection on your own is important to moving forward. Coach Celeste, Jordan, I want to personally thank you for uh, offering up your time and expertise and insights tonight. This was really helpful. Um, and I also want to thank College Tracker Canada uh, for giving us this opportunity to connect with prospective students.